Hello, this is Juanita James, President and CEO of Fairfield County's Community Foundation. Thank you for joining us and welcome. In celebration of the Foundation's 25th anniversary, we're hosting a series of specially themed webinars throughout the year to spark discussions about topics and issues impacting our communities in Fairfield County. At the Community Foundation, we're dedicated to creating lasting change in our region. As a philanthropic advisor, we manage over 570 charitable funds. As a grant maker, we've provided $220 million in support of nonprofits. And as a community partner, we unite people and resources to address pressing needs in the 23 towns and cities of Fairfield County. Recently, we produced a community well-being index to provide the evidence and data that highlights those needs. And we've also hosted a symposium on big best practices in community colleges. Some of you may recognize us through Giving Day, which this year brought 13,000 donors together in 24 hours to donate nearly $1.5 million to nonprofit organizations. We can't do this work without the support of all our partners, donors, nonprofits, elected officials, and other philanthropic organizations. Together, we thrive. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our host for today's session, R.J. Mercedes, manager of Fairfield County Community Foundation's Center for Nonprofit Excellence. RJ? Thank you, Juanita. Uh, I want to welcome you all to today's call. We have an impressive group joining us, including nonprofit leaders, funders, state employees, and consultants. Before we get going, I want to introduce Bruce Putterman, publisher of the Connecticut Mirror, for a short message. Thanks, RJ. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Um, the Connecticut Mirror, as you may know, is a, an, an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan, digital news publication. We cover issues that are important to residents of all of Connecticut um, with a focus on state government and policy and politics and education and health care. Our mission is to provide deep coverage of the areas that impact Connecticut residents most with the ultimate goal of increasing civic engagement, holding government accountable, and ultimately strengthening democracy here in Connecticut. Before I came down today, I uh, took a look at our numbers, uh, our readership numbers, and noted that um, in, the last, in the first six months of 2017, our readership is up 21% in Fairfield County relative to last year, first six months of the year. Um, so clearly uh, the word is spreading throughout the state. Uh, the issues that we cover in Hartford um, are important to, to everybody and, and we're particularly encouraged to see that uh, Fairfield County is discovering the Connecticut Mirror. Um, as I mentioned, we are, in fact, nonprofits. So unlike uh, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Norwalk Hour or the Stanford Advocate or the Connecticut Post, um, virtually all of our revenue is derived from uh, support from foundations and individual contributors. And uh, so uh, one final thing is that uh, we also operate Connecticut's um, state only statewide editorial op-ed page. And we invite you to submit your point of view on any issue you choose, not just the areas that we focus on, uh, in our effort to represent uh, and create dialogue amongst all voices throughout the state of Connecticut. And with that, I will turn it back to RJ. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, our topic today is an issue on everyone's mind, the Connecticut state budget. In these uncertain times, we need to understand our past and present actions so that we can plan for our future accordingly. I'm pleased to welcome Keith Faniff, the state budget reporter with the Connecticut Mirror, who has spent most of 24 years reporting as a reporter specializing in state government finances and is my go-to resource and seemingly daily update on what's happening at the state capitol. Welcome, Keith. Thanks for having me, RJ. Before we get started, I want to take care of some housekeeping. We do want this to be an interactive discussion, 
So we invite you to submit questions in the chat box that you should find on the right hand side of your screen. Please contribute your questions at any time. If you don't see the chat box, click on the small arrow in the top right hand corner. So let's get going. Keith, everyone agrees that our state finances are a mess. And the Connecticut Mirror has done an excellent job reporting on our financial woes with their five part A Legacy of Debt series. Can you give us a two minute summary of what got us to where we are today? Uh, absolutely, RJ. I, just before we start, I want to make sure that I thank the foundation uh, for inviting the mirror to participate. And I guess I want to tell everybody, um, I sort of apologize in advance. You're going to be getting a real crash course in, in state finances and, and a, a history of problems that goes back about 80 years. Um, I, I welcome all the questions. If, however, somebody feels like they didn't get an important question answered because we ran out of time, I'm leaving all my contact information with RJ and Beth and Ashley at the foundation, and they've assured me that uh, anybody who needs my cell phone or email or Twitter handle, they can get you that however you prefer. So with that, um, let's start by talking, like I said, uh, what got us here. Um, it actually does go back close to 80 years, if you really want to understand the problems that we're looking at, you have to go all the way back to 1939 because so much of our problem right now relates to the retirement benefit program that we offer state employees and municipal school teachers. Those are the fastest growing portions, sorry we had a little technical difficulty here, fastest growing portions by far of the state budget. But what you need to understand is the reason those costs are exploding are because of the history. Between 1939 and the mid-1980s, Connecticut effectively saved nothing for the benefits it promised. In other words, when it hired John Doe or Jane Smith to work as a state employee or a teacher, it should have been setting aside money every single year and better still investing that money so that when John Doe or Jane Smith retired, the money was already there for their pension. By not setting aside that money, not only were they leaving the cost to their children and grandchildren, but they forfeited huge investment earnings, and the compounding effect is enormous. I said that happened from the late 30s until the mid-1980s. Okay, It didn't get that much better after that. From the, the mid-80s until the, the late 2000s, we routinely saved less than we were supposed to. To cover these costs. So if we can go to the first graphic I'd like to show you, a second Connecticut pension fund threatens future state budget. What this shows you is going into this calendar year, the state employee pension fund contribution, which is in red, and the teacher's pension fund contribution, you can see over the next 15 years they were scheduled to skyrocket, going over about six billion dollars a year. Costs that right now are between about a billion and a billion uh, billion two in, in, in FY17 and jump up a little bit more, you see them, them erupt. In some cases, they're growing fivefold. We actually, this year, restructured part of the state employee pension system to try to keep the payments below $3 billion a year. To do that, though, it's just like refinancing a mortgage. It's not cheap. We had to shift between 14 and 21 billion dollars in costs on the future generation. Uh, if we could just jump for a minute to the second graphic, a missed opportunity to say, I wanted to just point out that, and, and, and I'm not going all the way back to 1939 here, it's not like Connecticut didn't have money that it could put away. And I just want to show you very quickly, in about a decade and a half, you can see that the state budget ran up about six billion dollars in surpluses. But only one third of it was actually saved in the rainy day fund, the emergency reserve. The rest was spent and not, I would point out, on pension contributions. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to go right now and immediately shift to the third graphic here, pension shortfall, your share. I, I think it's important to explain um, how much of a national outlier we are because people say, well, what are, what are other states doing to solve this type of problem? And that question is based on the assumption that our other, other states are in as much trouble as we are. They're actually not. If you look at this map, it's a map of 
per capita state pension debt. In other words, the state size is proportional to the amount of money it owes. Illinois, Alaska, which unfortunately is not pictured on this map of the lower 48, and Connecticut are by far the worst in the nation. We owe $14,769 just in pension debt for every man, woman, and child in the state. That's three and a half times the national average of 4,300. So when people say, you know, what are other states doing? Again, the main thing they're doing is not getting into the same problems we are. That, that for the most part, is how we got into this situation. Thank you, Keith. I know we could talk for days on what got us to where we are, so appreciate your, your quick summary there. So looking ahead, uh, until the Connecticut legislature passes a new budget, Governor Malloy controls the state finances. What does that actually mean, especially for current payments to services rendered? That's, that's a good question, because I would almost argue uh, not Governor Malloy, not the legislature. I would argue almost that the past controls our finances. So much of what happens at the Capitol is beyond the discretion of any one office. Um, fixed costs, and by fixed costs I'm referring to things that are spelled out either by contractual obligation or federal entitlement rules like Medicaid, right now are eating up about 60% of the budget. Um, to give you some idea what we're talking about, um, I'm just going to ask uh, RJ to call up the next graphic, retirement benefits and debt, gobble up the budget. And this graphic just looks at four line items, four line items in an $18 billion general fund. They are our contributions to the state employee pension, our contribution to the teacher pension, our contributions to retirement health care for state employees, not, not health care for existing workers. And by the way, the retirement health care benefit is actually worse funded than the pensions we talked about. So those three retirement benefit line items and general fund debt service. Those are the payments when we borrow money to build schools, uh, to fix state buildings, to preserve farmland and open space. In 1997, they consumed 12% of the general fund. This past fiscal year that just ended, they consumed 31% of the general fund. And that's just the beginning of an explosion when you consider the fact of where those pension funds are going. Um, if we can then go to, to the next graphic, uh, Connecticut's revenue engine is stuck in low gear. Um, if you think of our, our legacy of debt sort of as the hammer, this is, this is the anvil. This is sort of the, the hard place we're trapped in along with the rock. We made a ton of money off our income tax in the 90s and the 2000s. Some people find these numbers hard to believe. But for example, between 1995 and 1999, the portion of our income tax related to capital gains and dividends, which is what this chart shows, it grew in a four-year period in the mid-90s by 23%. I wish I could have fit that one on the graphic, but another four-year stretch from 2004 to 2008, it grew by an average of 19%. It's volatile, and in bad times it does go down, but in good times it performs like nothing else. The problem is since the Great Recession ended in 2011, We've only had one year of positive double-digit growth, and much more importantly, the growth projected out into the future is much more modest, 2 and 3%. So while we had a lot of money coming in, that's not the case anymore. So you've got the legislature and the governor basically stuck in a box. They know that the fixed costs are minimized. I, excuse me, the fixed costs are growing and the revenue is minimized. Uh, thanks. I think it's important to know where, in reality, where, where we stand going forward. I want to do a little projection for our final question. Before we get there, just want to remind you, if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, send it through the chat function, and we'd, we'd love to um, we have some time at the end to make sure we get those questions answered for you. So thinking ahead, uh, considering how the state of Connecticut is raising and spending money, what are the, impl impl what are the implications 
for residents with lower incomes. What does this mean in terms of the opportunity gap? So for those not aware, closing the opportunity gap is de defined as eliminating, eliminating disparities in income, education, employment, housing, and health. I know that's a lot to unpack, but... <laughs> That's okay, RJ. I apologize in advance. I'm going to throw a few extra numbers out in this answer, but I think it's important for people to understand. I'm going to try to frame this in the context of the problem we're facing with the new state budget. Analysts are saying that uh, if state finances are not adjusted, they would run as much as 12% in deficit this fiscal year, meaning we spend $2.3 billion more than we take in. And next fiscal year, the potential gap's up to 14% or $2.8 billion. And I, and I realize that that can just make you roll your eyes. Um, to give you some context, though, that's about two-thirds the size of the unprecedented problem that uh, we faced in 2011, the, the huge deficit Governor Molloy always talks about that he inherited from Governor Rell and the 2011 um, General Assembly. And I would just add, this is only the first in a series of painful deficits likely to continue every two years for the next decade and a half. And some of them almost certainly will be far worse than this when the retirement debt costs grow almost exponentially. So with that as context, I'm going to go to the, uh, to the, the last graphic. I have a shrinking share of the budget. Uh, Connecticut Voices for Children has been tracking uh, for some time now, something that they call the children's budget, where they literally analyze all segments of the state budget with programs that impact children. I'm going to first go off the graphic and take you all the way back to 1991, the year we established the state income tax. More than 40% of the budget went for programs that impact children, social services, health care, uh, child welfare. We're now under 30%. And projections have us within a couple of years, we're going to be closing in on 25%. What does that mean in this budget that's being debated right now at the Capitol? As again, these retirement benefit costs are surging, the revenues are not growing, and these retirement benefits are almost like crabgrass in a backyard that's fenced in, and your backyard's not getting any bigger. But the crabgrass is spreading and it's squeezing everything else out. Well, unfortunately, it's programs for children, it's programs for the poor, it's health care and education that are feeling the squeeze more than anything else. Uh, some of the proposals that have been put out for a new two-year state budget have 9,000 working poor adults becoming ineligible for the Husky program, which is the state-subsidized health care, health insurance program. We have proposals to take the state earned income tax credit can both reduce it and eliminate it. Right now, we provide a credit equal to 27.5% of the federal EITC. Again, this is an income tax credit for the working poor. Um, don't underestimate the impact on social services that we'll see with a proposal to actually shift a portion of this teacher pension debt onto cities and towns. Governor Malloy has a plan to ask them to pick up one-third of the cost. That's $400 million this fiscal year out of $1.2 billion. And if the teacher pension bill is actually going to grow to $6 billion a year by the early 2030s and towns own one-third of that, that $2 billion represents the size of an entire education cost-sharing program. In other words, our entire program for financing local education would be matched by the teacher pension bill towns would owe the state. The town manager in Coventry estimated this would consume 12% of its entire budget by the late 2020s and would basically eliminate any type of social services they would offer. Um, the last example I would give is um, we, we have a new proposal from the governor to, to zero out the Smart Start program, an effort to expand um, preschool. Two years after it was launched, it would basically be neutralized. Um, not trying to take a side in this issue, but if I, I sort of have to give you a wrapping thought before we go to specific questions. The reason this austerity approach is very problematic is because you can do all the painful cuts you want and maybe you'll escape this legislative session. I won't even say with minimal tax hikes, but by minimizing them. But that doesn't provide stability. You have ever worsening gaps that are still coming over the next 14 or 15 years. And right now, people aren't really 
discussing how you want to solve them. So hopefully we have some questions on that now. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions coming in. Thank you for all that are getting to uh, submit your questions. First one is, you mentioned retirement health care benefits. Do all public se sector workers get health care in retirement? Is that on the table at all in budget discussions? Um, that's a good question. Let's break it down to municipal and state. At the municipal level, it can vary community by community. So I can't speak necessarily to that. At the state level right now, Connecticut is required to offer retirement health care to all workers at least through 2022. And excuse me, I don't mean they would only provide it through 2022. I mean everybody they hire would go into that system through 2022, meaning we could still be paying retirement health care into the 2060s, 2070s, um, depending, of course, on how long people live. That is potentially going to be extended even more. The, the concessions deal that the legislature is considering right now, the House passed it yesterday, the Senate hasn't voted, would extend that benefits program for another five years. The reason it's so controversial is right now we only set aside, we set aside a little less than half of the money we're supposed to every year to cover this benefit. The rest, when today's workers retire in the future, we're counting on our children to find that money. And this concessions deal reduces the size of the bill, the millions of dollars in bills we mail every year to our kids. It does not eliminate it. So retirement health care is probably the single most controversial state benefit. If you were to compare it to a pension system and you said, how much have we saved versus how much do we owe? We only have enough assets to cover less than 1% of our long-term obligations. That's probably, by the way, the most depressing question, so it only gets better after this. <laughs> uh, thanks. So two kind of related questions. One is around how do we work our way out of this hole of rising fixed costs and failing revenue? But um, I think in a more inspiring or uplifting, do you, is there a legislator that you would consider a leader in seriously thinking about the state's fiscal policy and figuring out a way to address the issues that we have li lying ahead? Well, tackling the second question first, and I really sympathize with the person asking the question as a journalist, I probably shouldn't weigh in on who's a leader, but I guess I would try to answer it this way. I would say a leader is anyone who's really tackling the question. My, my biggest frustration, simply as a citizen myself, is I see so few people discussing the problem holistically. It's one thing if you say, well, listen, I don't necessarily believe in, in an austerity approach and I don't believe in deep cuts, but some people say I could live with them if I knew we were doing this for one or two years and then that put us on the right track and we we're all set. But I'm just telling you right now, you can do that for the next two years and then in year three, the pension costs surge again, the retirement benefit costs surge again. And so... It, it, that will not bring you the stability. And here's, unfortunately, I, I guess I lied when I said I had answered the most depressing question. Um, to a large extent, there's not much you can do with these costs. More than 80% of the contribution we make every year to the state employee's pension and to the teacher's pension has nothing to do with today's workers. It's literally to cover payments that previous legislatures and governors didn't make, and therefore investment earnings that previous governors and legislatures never achieved because they didn't make the payments and the earnings on the earnings and so on. So unless we feel that a federal judge is going to tell the richest state and the richest nation in the world, you can punt on your bills, I don't think Connecticut has much choice but to say, okay, how much do we owe over the next 15 years? What flexibility do we have legally to reduce it? And then when we can be honest with ourselves about what we can't eliminate, then we have to decide, how do we spread the cost out? And right now, nobody's having that discussion because it's the shoot the messenger fear. Politicians fear just telling the public that will cause so much anger. They'll vote against the person who shares the information. Well, it's definitely a very sobering conversation, but I think a really important one to have. Um, I want to officially wrap, get us out of here at, at 1225. Like we said, we're going to continue for a few more minutes. We have a couple more questions coming in, and we're going to try to answer as many as we can. But uh, I just want to get through a couple opportunities. 
So uh, first, I want to thank uh, Keith and Bruce and the entire Connecticut Mirror team for your continued excellent work covering issues affecting Connecticut. We're honored to steal you away for today's webinar. I urge you to check out the Connecticut Mirror's website, ctmirror.org, for in-depth, nonpartisan reporting on government policies and politics. If you aren't connected with them yet, be sure to visit the Connecticut Community Nonprofit Alliance's website, listed on this slide. As the largest member organization in the state dedicated to working with nonprofits, they are a great resource to stay connected on public policy updates. And lastly, on November 1st, the Center for Nonprofit Excellence will be hosting a workshop on right-sizing operations, specifically in times of serious financial constraints. More details on this workshop and many more offerings can be found at fccfoundation.org slash CNE. Uh, we will be recording today's webinar and posting up on our website. And we have a couple more uh, webinars happening on the 25th of the month in August, September, and October. So definitely continue to come back to our website and we'll invite you all uh, to join us for fur further conversations. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining today's call. Hopefully you can stay on for a couple more minutes uh, to answer our last couple of questions that we have. Um, so another question coming in uh, for you, Keith. Can the state change a contract, contractual promise under any conditions other than bankruptcy? Okay, thank you for, for that question. Before I answer it, just quickly, I'll remind everyone, if I didn't get to your question, um, I know RJ has all my contact information, and maybe RJ, you can share that with anybody who felt that, you know, they didn't get a chance to get their question in. Um, Certainly. States don't have the legal option to declare bankruptcy. In Connecticut, I, I mentioned to you earlier about how we're sort of a national outlier in terms of the amount of retirement benefit debt that we have. We're also a national outlier in the fact that we promise almost all of these benefits contractually. Only four states, and Connecticut is one of them, commit to the pensions for their state employees and the retirement health care for their state employees contractually. When people hear other states, like Rhode Island, reduce their benefits, and I'm not getting into the moral question of should you or should you not change a retirement benefit, Rhode Island had tremendous legal flexibility because they existed only in statute. They just had to change the law. And when people went to court, the judge said, I'm sorry, Jane Doe, you never had a contractual promise. You just had a statute. In Connecticut, they have a contract. And the teacher's pension exists only in statute, but, and it's a huge but, we borrowed $2 billion in 2008 to shore up our teacher pension fund because it was so cash starved. And when we borrowed the money in what's called the bond covenant, our contract with our investors, we promised to continue to make full payments into the teacher pension arc for the life of that 25 year bond issuance. So in other words, until we pay off, until we pay off that debt in around 2033, we're contractually locked into that system. There really is, I mean, I, mean I, I feel bad because so many people are saying, well, give me the solution. And it's sort of like we're understandably trying to return groceries that were purchased and consumed decades ago. And we just keep getting a bigger bill for some, you know, catered party that people held year after year. That's really what we're looking at. The best way to deal with your obligations, again, not take your side, unfortunately, is to pay them down and pay them as soon as you can. But that's going to involve not just labor concessions, it's going to involve significant tax increases. That's not me lobbying for taxes. That's giving you the math. Um, state employees could march in the Capitol tomorrow and demand you cancel their pension for the good of the state. And we'd still have a tough road to hoe because the real cost isn't today's state employees. By far, the overwhelming share of the cost are the teachers and the state employees already off the job. Hmm. So the uh, question that came in, it, it seems pretty related to that was just, is it true that retiree benefits cannot be restructured? So if there's anything else you wanted to add in there. Well, um, it's, it's, it's yeah. largely you can't, you can do some, move, move the numbers very marginally around the edges in terms of administrative costs. But no, that, that you really can't because again, they're, they're spelled out by contract. Um, and I, I think some people have felt like, well, look, if we went to a judge and said, we raised taxes and they're going to produce diminishing returns, I hate to say it, they're already producing diminishing returns. The problem is, I think a federal judge is going to tell Connecticut, 
no one ever promised you you were always going to be the wealthiest state and the wealthiest nation in the world. You're not Arkansas yet, and until then, keep paying your bills. Um, it, it really is difficult, but that's also why we're not having a discussion. When we, when we cut transportation investments, when we cut education investments, when we cut healthcare investments, we're not telling people, well, we're going to keep doing this for a couple more years until these are beyond down to the bone, and then that still doesn't get us out of the problem. We still have 12 or 13 more years of, of, of budgetary contractions to go, and at some point, you know, you, you are looking at revenue just in terms of sheer math. Um, the numbers just don't play out any other way. The, the, the pension bills are growing faster by far than our best boom economic growth period we ever have to those who hope, well, maybe we can grow our way out of this. You need a combination of cutting spending, raising taxes, and hopefully seeing economic growth just to make the math work. Again, not, not arguing for a solution. I'm just saying if you want the numbers to add up, there really is nothing else that does it. Hmm. So we've got uh, put two more questions up. Uh, one is Republicans have a budget that will be balanced. Why isn't that even considered? Well, the Republican budget right now, one, relies on huge levels of labor savings that are to be achieved unilaterally. And there are huge questions about whether or not that's balanced. One thing I need to point out is both parties like to say, our numbers were vetted by nonpartisan staff. And unfortunately, the media doesn't do a good job explaining that. That's not really correct. The nonpartisan office of fiscal analysis will always check somebody's math. But if the Republicans put in their budget, we're going to raise $2 billion next fiscal year by selling this commemorative stapler on eBay. The Office of Fiscal Analysis is not going to come in and go, come on, no one's going to pay you $2 billion for a stapler. They're literally just going to check your math. Well, you got $15 million from the income tax. you got $2 billion from the stapler. Yes, that gets you to 17. 15 plus 2, 17. Your math is good. They don't really test the assumption. They're not, that's, not the, that's not their role in these proposals. You can make a very legitimate argument that every single budget proposal that's been issued to date, Democratic, Republican, and gubernatorial, is out of balance. The question is simply how much. Sure. Uh, so I think we had a couple more questions come in just in the last minute or two, and we'll be, be sure to answer those questions and get them out to everybody. Um, our final question is, what is the age range of the employees receiving the benefits that are causing the issue, and how many will be retiring soon that are entitled to these benefits? Is there a forecast of the cost and when the cost will end? That's a, a good final question. I can't tell you precisely the age range, and I don't mean to be indelicate, but literally the reason things are projected to sort of reach a, an, an excruciatingly painful peak in the early to mid-2030s is by that point, again, just to be blunt, the perception is most of the retirees from the worst funded periods in state history will have passed on by then. So that is why people are saying, okay, when does Connecticut ever see some relief in this area? Is that by the mid-2030s and later, the people who will be retired will be from an era where we had saved more money for their retirement. And of course, they, the numbers shift because people are living longer. The pension funds haven't always adjusted their mortality rates. Healthcare inflation, a lot of people in this country guessed wrong on that. These are all factors that are weighing in. But that's why, I mean, we are headed into a decade and a half of almost exponential growth in our retirement benefit costs. Um, nothing that's proposed out there is, is anything more than how do, we, how do we run the gauntlet this time around? Um, if, I could, if I could grope for a, a 1980s video game analogy, if you ever remember playing Space Invaders in the first wave of Invaders, you had eight well, if you get through this one, it goes to 10, then to 12, and eventually it starts adding on, you know, 20 and 30. Those last waves, I don't even want to, you know, you've got to have a whole stack of quarters if you want to get through that one. Uh, thank you for that analogy. Uh, so we're going to end it up, end it here. Uh, Keith, I again, want to thank you for your expertise and your just level of knowledge and, and sharing with us today. Um, we'll be recording this webinar and posting sh shortly on the FCCFoundation.org website. Um, please stay tuned for more, and um, 
have a great day. Thank you.